I am going to talk. Oh, I'm going to click. So you got it. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk today about um, some long-term uh, scenarios, uh, ESM scenarios that uh, uh, we um, ran and analyzed. Um, originally, this this analysis came out of a figure that I needed to make for, or wanted to make for the IPCC AR6, um, but we decided that there, you know there's is, is worth is worth uh, turning into a manuscript um, to compare some of these long-term scenarios because there's some interesting stuff that happens. Um, so yeah, so uh, the title of this is Multi-Century Dynamics of the Climate and Carbon Cycle Under Both High and Net Negative Emission Scenarios. Um, and Okay, so yeah, so the idea here, the, the, the key question we want to uh, ask here is about the proportionality of warming to cumulative <coughs> CO2 emissions. Um, does does it have limits? Does this proportionality of warming to emissions have limits? And if so, what are they? Um, and so, you know, on the left is this figure from the IPCC AR6 summary for policymakers, um, showing the you know the the warming projected the projected warming and projected emissions as well as the historical warming and historical emissions, um, but uh, from the pre-industrial period out to 2050. Um, and so, the, you know, there, there was deliberate decision made to stop it there at 2050 because after 2050, particularly under some of these low and uh, and, and 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 then negative emission scenarios, um, you know, there's some possible complexity that happens. Um, and then, you know, so in this figure from this paper by uh, Matthews out 2020. You know that we sort of outlined a bunch of different ways in which the TCRE, uh, this idea of, of 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 that warming is proportional to cumulative emissions, and this idea is 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 um, sort of encapsulated in this acronym, the TCRE, which is the Transient Climate Response to Emissions. Um, and so we explore this idea of, of the ways in which the, the TCRE, you know, nonlinearities um, might might uh, you know where it might start to diverge from, from linearity. Particular ideas like permafrost feedbacks or residual radiative saturation that might cause either positive or negative curvature um, uh, in in this kind of thing. And so so the key things we want to do is use some of these uh, long term extension scenarios to ask um, you know where, where are where are the boundaries of of of, of the linear the proportionality of warming. To cumulative CO2 emissions. Uh, and then, you know, I think perhaps most importantly, sort of from a policy relevant perspective is does this relationship hold under net negative CO2 emissions? I, as you move, as you stop moving from left to right on this kind of figure and start moving back from right to left because of net negative CO2 emissions, do, do you get the same proportionality of warming to cumulative emissions or not? Uh, and so um, the what we're going to do here uh, in this analysis is compare two of these long-term scenarios. Um, one is the SP585 scenario, so it's super high emissions, you know, kind of the, the uh, you know border borderline of, of of what's even possible to burn, basically burning everything possible, um, and uh, uh, you know extending beyond 2100 out to 2300, as well as this um, uh, SP534 overshoot scenario, which is um, basically diverges from the SP 585 and 2040, the 2040 or 2045, I forget which, um, and and then basically says, okay, now now we're going to try and, uh, you know, reverse climate change. Basically, you know, this, the premise of the scenario is basically we, you know, sort of follow along this kind of, you know, quote unquote business as usual pathway, and then suddenly, you know, Get get our wisdom and and decide we want we we actually don't want to go down this pathway and and reverse courses you know to the point to, that's that's physically plausible you know I mean wh whether or not it actually is plausible is sort of a separate question here um, but uh, but but basically you know reverse CO two emissions uh, go into this overshoot and then stabilize basically this end, then ends up stabilizing the long term at the at the same level as the um, SP one dash two point six scenario um, and so it allows you in uh, and, and and you know an ability to explore what happens under strong net negative CO2 emissions in the same context as this, as these um, super high emissions. So these are really sort of two very broad bracketing um, uh, scenarios that the 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 outline the, the you know plausible space um, of, over the next couple hundred years. Um, and so you know in these scenarios the you know the the you see as sort of as you'd expect super high amounts of warming um, in the global uh, mean for the surface air temperature ranges right so including and because some of these models have high climate sensitivities we get you know just unbelievably large amount of warming right so greater than 10 degrees C in some of these models um, so you know in a way these high super high end emission scenarios are already on the face of it like 
kind of uninteresting from policy perspective because like these are worlds in uh, you know the the high emission scenario is a world in which we've you know we've completely lost the battle against climate change and you know all, just unimaginably awful awful world right um but it's still interesting to to explore you know the dynamic the couple dynamics of carbon climate under such a scenario um in the overshoot scenario things then peak uh, and then reverse and so you have a, a fairly strong temperature decline um out to about 2200 and then uh, in one model then uh, subsequent reversal and some some warming, which I'll get into, um, and so again, this is you know bounding bounding the the sort of what what might be plausible, um, and so the the first question we want to ask is you know what 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 happens to the carbon fluxes in these scenarios, right? So so on the left are, are the um, cumulative emissions, excuse me, the, the the instantaneous emissions that are compatible with these scenarios. So these are run as concentration force scenarios, and thus we had to um, back at calculate the compatible emissions based on the changes in inventory in the atmosphere, land, and ocean reservoirs um, that would be um, consistent with these with these emissions, um, or with you know with the emissions that would be consistent with those. Um, and and so the black line shows the actual sort of scenario emissions, and each of the the colored lines from each of the models is the compatible emissions. So the first thing you see is that you know the the the, the emulators used to construct the scenarios aren't crazy. That we can we can do a lot of of interesting science. You know even even outside in this sort of um, you know, pushing the envelope of of of, of these models um, in this concentration force scenario, um, that the, the models aren't super disagreeing in terms of the emissions that go in and out. The second thing you see is that um, at least on the ocean, so on the right hand panel, the the, the ocean sink follows really strongly the the shape of of the the emissions curve. Um, basically, when when emissions become negative under the overshoot scenario, the ocean uh, 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 sink becomes negative, becomes a source um, in response response to that transient uh, up, up, uptake uh, or that yeah, yeah, transient uptake of negative emissions. Um, and, and in general, in many ways, the ocean is basically kind of a mirror of, of the emissions. On um, the peak, it's sort of this, basically the same time decline in the, in the high end scenario as well. So, so really, what you can see right off the bat is that ocean uh, ocean fluxes follow emissions very closely. On land, it's a, it's it's a bit more complicated. That in, on the land, both the, the um, both scenarios, the land can become uh, a source, so switch from being a sink to a source. Um, uh, but for very different reasons, and I'll get into that. Um, and that, but the models, of course, you know, as we come to expect, the land models they they disagree much more with each other than uh, ocean models do as well. But uh, but also that there's there's this general con, you know consistency of of the idea that sources. Uh, excuse me, emissions drive the land as well. That when 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 our emissions are high, the land acts as a sink. When our emissions, in inter cases where emissions become net negative, the land also switches from sink to source uh, in order to counteract that. Um, and so and so we we can already see just by doing this straight comparison between the emissions time series and the land and ocean sinks. This this idea that, that in both cases, you know, the land and ocean tend to to resist whatever we're doing. And if we flip what we're doing, they're going to resist that as well. Um, but the next thing I want to do is, is you know, ask this question of, well, how much do the models actually agree with each other, right? And we're, we're again, we're, you know, these are sort of envelope pushing experiments to, to see, you know, where does, you know, where is their model agreement or disagreement? Um, and, and, and so here we're looking at the zonal mean carbon flux um, for uh, uh, over the land for both these scenarios. So on the left is the SP585 scenario, and the right is the SP534 overshoot scenario. Um, and and to what, what we see sort of on, on the left is basically the models disagree on about everything they possibly can disagree on. They disagree on the timing, the location, and the strength of these feedbacks over the land, um, you know, particularly under the high emission channels. So some models show two strong zonal you know, sink activities, one in the tropics, one in the high latitudes. Um, other models show basically that the that the that only, the only real sink is the high latitudes in the tropics is kind of weak and then actually becomes a source, um, whereas some models also then say actually no because if we we're losing permafrost carbon feedback the high latitude doesn't even act as a sink and also becomes a source. Um, and so you can see that, like the you know, as well as the the, the general sort of timing of each of these is very different. Um, really? Yes, Jim. Is there land use in these, or can you just refresh us one more time? Like the scenarios, are these really idealized, or is there land use in there too? There is land use in the, in these scenarios. Yeah. And so these are these are with land use. These are that we're not separating out land use, and we're not separating out the beta, beta and gamma feedback. So this is just the net the net carbon flux in the presence of land use. Um, and the and the way in which the land use is, is specified after twenty one hundred is basically that the the um, it 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 it's it sort of linear. The land use carbon flux basically is linear, de, linearly decreases to zero 
by 2150, from 2100 to 2050, excuse me, 2100 to 2150, I'm holding that same pattern. So, so most of the land use dynamics, you know, the basically the role of land use weakens uh, in these long-term scenarios, but it's still present. And of course, the land is still responding to prior land use. Um, and so, yeah, so this, the, the tropical sinks that are present in the models that show a tropical sink are, are, are even in the presence of land use um, over the historical and near future period. Um, uh, on the, in the overshoot scenario, um, you know, again, there's, so what you see is this sort of, you know, the, the, the carbon sink that then weakens after, you know, after the, the, the period of, of, of strong positive emissions and in some cases reverses. Um, and, and where it reverses, you know, tends to be driven by the, by the tropical carbon sink to source transition. Um, but, in, you know, in general, the carbon cycle response is much more muted. And again, you see, you know, pretty large disagreement, you know, qualitatively about the relative importance between the high latitude sink or source uh, and the tropical <laughs> sink or source. Um, and again, you know, the, the UVIC ESCM, which is an EMIC, it's sort of the, the, the most or system, you know, the, the least, the, the, the most complex of the reduced complexity, uh, you know, uh, 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 EMICs. Um, and, 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 in, and in particular includes a representation of the permafrost carbon feedback. Um, also shows, you know, even in this scenario, a, a, a fairly substantial loss of, of carbon during the, you know, in, in the, the, the period of, of high emissions, you know, in the, in the latter half of the century, um, which, uh, which never really reverses. It weakens, you know, after, after the climate cools again, but it never reverses. Um, and so you can already, you know, start to see, you know, these really strong, you know, both quantitative as in the prior slide, but also importantly qualitative differences about the timing, magnitude, uh, yeah, and location of, 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 of transitions in, in the, in the terrestrial cycle. Um, and, and, and where this becomes, you know, I think depressing as a land modeler is when you compare that to the ocean in which the qualitative agreement is, is just really high between all the models. Like they basically all, all of these models are telling the same story, which is, you know, that the, under the high emission scenario, you get, you know, a, a strong carbon uptake um, in, in, particularly in the, in the Southern Ocean um, that's sustained, right? You get a, a, a sort of poleward shift of, of the Southern Ocean carbon sink. You get a weakening of the North Atlantic uh, or, the, or the Northern Hemisphere carbon sink. Um, the, the, you know, the, the pre-industrial carbon uh, uh, source in the tropics kind of weakens, right? So basically they're all sort of in lockstep with each other in terms of the, the spatial pattern and the timing of these transitions in both these scenarios, right? In the overshoot scenario, um, again, you get this kind of the, the weakening of, of basically the pre-existing patterns that are happening and kind of a reversion to, um, to, to, to more of a pre-industrial like um, uh, pattern in, 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 in the carbon fluxes. Um, there is of course disagreement in the magnitude of the feedbacks. And I should say that, you know, the, 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 the ensemble spread of the total integrated global uh, ocean carbon flux still increases, you know, fairly dramatically after 2100. Um, and so it's not that the oceans are all, you know, quant quantitatively telling exactly the same story, but qualitatively they are telling basically the same story. And so I think, what, you know, one of the key results here is this, this, this underlying difference, you know, we, we've come to expect that land models have, have a wider spread than ocean models, but, but I think when you, when you start to look at it regionally, you really see that the ocean models are all telling the same story, uh, whereas the land models are all telling, you know, pretty much completely different stories. Um, and, and so th this, this, this difference between the land models um, under these two scenarios sort of, you know, becomes uh, you know, also interesting if you if you look at the the partitioning of 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 the land uh, sink or or source on, as the case may be um, between vegetation and and soil, right? Um, and so some models show uh, you know uh, well, the sort of one thing that, that a lot of the models tend to show is is a is is a net uptake in the vegetation pool at high latitudes, right? Basically, longer growing seasons, um, you know, CO two fertilization, plants are relatively happy at high latitudes, and they're gonna gonna you know store more carbon um, in the tropics. It's, 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 it's much less clear, right? Some models show sinks in the vegetation, some models show sources. Um, uh, and, and, you know, under these overshoot scenarios, um, uh, 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 Oh, sorry, excuse me. This is this is excuse me. Sorry, this is all in the over over the overshoot scenario. So, so I guess the, the, the key point here is that is that um, the vegetation, you know, can. can can reverse in, in some of these models, um, and whereas the um, the soil basically once you either gain or lose carbon from the soil, you don't really see the reversals in the same way. It basically sort of stops changing uh, under the overshoot scenario, but it doesn't really reverse in under any cases. Um, and the high emissions, yeah, sorry, this, sorry, I was narrowing these in the wrong words. Under the high emission scenario, 
all of the models show this this uptake of the of the vegetation to high latitudes, um, whereas some models show a you know pretty substantial loss of carbon from vegetation in in the tropics, whereas others show a pretty strong uptake of carbon from tropics. Um, and, and and again, this is you know after twenty one hundred, the land use dynamics are, are are fairly muted. So most of what you see in these long term scenarios is the the, the response to climate CO two. Um, in the soil in these long term scenarios, again, you see really broad divergence between some models, you know, basically the ones that, ha that, that have permafrost, which are uh, uh, CSM2 WACM and, and UVIC ESCM, show large losses of carbon from high latitudes, whereas uh, other models show large uh, losses of carbon from the tropics um, and or mid latitudes uh, in the soil. And so again, you know, really, really different stories between these different models, right? So it's, so I, you know, I think that the, the take home from, for this is that, you know, we tend to say, oh, you know, we just need to fix such and such a process and then we can, you know, we'll solve this problem of land model disagreement. And I think the key thing is that, is that that's not, you know, that's not correct, right? Is the models are disagreeing with each other in, in, in basically every way, way they can. Um, and, and, and in order to sort of solve this model agreement on the, on the land problem, it's, you know, it's going to require um, many, many different strategies to interact to get it, you know, sort of basically, what are the vegetation responses? Do we understand them? Do we, you know, can we find agreement? What are the soil, um, what are the soil responses? Where do we expect soil responses to change, et cetera? Um, sort of now sort of, you know, st again, stepping back a little bit, but 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 presenting at least sort of the multimodal mean um, in the, in this case, again, you see, you know, much higher agreement between the between the ocean models, you know, the, the stippled area where there's low model agreement. And here we define low model agreement as being, I think, um, uh, two or more models disagree in sign with from from the ensemble mean. Um, uh, and on the land, basically, you know, particularly under the under the high uh, high emission scenario after 2100, you know, very large amounts of the land are are um, are covering the stippling. Although, you know, typically, well, although what you do see actually is that there is reasonable agreement that certain parts of the of the land will um, will you know have re relatively robust changes. And I think one of the key uh, things that you see in this is this increased sensitivity to the Amazon, as uh, particularly as compared to the maritime tropical forest region. Um, this you know this this seems to be a uh, a thing that comes comes you know, emerges in multiple different ways in these, uh, you know, multiple different analyses tend to show the increased vulnerability of the Amazon as compared to, to um, uh, both either Africa or particularly the maritime continent. Um, uh, but but here the, what you see is that, you know, really strong losses of carbon, net losses of carbon from the Amazon, even in a period with weak, def with weak land use changes in the high emission scenario, um, whereas the, the maritime continents are still taking up carbon. And, and, and you know, in the 23rd century, the, the maritime continent also sort of switches, um, but, but, the, but the, you know, the Amazon switches sooner. Um, in the overshoot scenario, again, you know, you see uptake in, 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 in the uh, high latitudes and then this kind of weak reversal of the tropical, you know, basically the tropical forest sink that's been governing things historically and in the near future sort of reverses under, under net negative um, CO2 emissions uh, as the, you know, as basically as the, as the tropical forest outgassed carbon in response to declining CO2 fertilization. Um, and again, particularly strongly in, in the Amazon uh, uh, where, where there is actual model agreement on that. Um, you can, if you plot all these things under a single plot like this, so basically, you know, the, the, the purple line is kind of the driving things, which is the emissions, and the black line is the, is the CO2 accumulation rate in the atmosphere. Um, and, and by plotting, whereas this sort of hatching, that's the difference between the two of them is the, are the net sinks uh, in land and ocean, which in some cases become sources. And so by plotting it this way, you can sort of see the, 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 the shift in timing. Um, basically, you know, uh, do, we, do, do, do we, like, at what point do we um, get a decline in atmospheric CO2 concentration? Uh, does, that either, does that either lead or lag when our, uh, when our emissions go to zero? Um, and on the right-hand side, what you can see is that, is that yeah, the, we actually get a lead, a lead of the, of the a flip of the atmospheric CO2 concentration from increasing to decreasing that, that leads the, 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 net neg the, the shift from net positive to neg negative emissions by about a decade or so. Um, but that, but that pretty quickly they, they reverse. Um, and, and so the, 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 the sinks can become sources. And so, um, uh, and, and therefore off, you know, because the, the, the sinks become sources, then you get the, 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 the change in atmospheric CO2 is actually smaller than the, than the, than the uh, emissions themselves. Um, and so, so, you know, this, this good news in the sense that, that, that these, you know, 
even though the emissions um, are projected to, to change from sink to source, they don't totally offset. We still, you know, we still have um, a, a net decline in CO2 over this period. Um, it's just weaker than we would have otherwise, right? Because the, um, the, the sink is no longer acting in, you know, as a sink. It's actually, you know, basically acting in to resist whatever we do to the atmosphere. So that just as, you know, 50% of our emissions right now are being taken up by the sink, if we go to net negative emissions, some, some you know, large fraction of, of our net negative emissions will that will also be offset because of this this shift from the land uh, and, and our ocean uh, during the period of, of, of net negative CO2. Um, and in the high emission scenario on the left, it's, you know, it's basically, again, you know, as we get a peak in the emissions, we also have a peak in the sink. And then as the emissions uh, weaken, the sinks also weaken uh, and or possibly become sources in the, in the, in, in the land. Um, so, and then because I don't have much time, yeah, so to get to the, 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 the key question that I wanted to pose or that I posed at the beginning of this, which is, you know, under what conditions does this proportionality of, of warming to cumulative emissions hold under these two pretty extreme and extremely different scenarios? Um, and roughly, they, they actually hold pretty well, you know, that even if under the high emissions out to, you know, 5,000, you know, petagrams of carbon, um, we, you still get, a, you know, a, a fairly strong linearity or fairly, you know, the linearity roughly holds. Um, bet between these models, um, you know, at the very tail under under uh, under the high emission scenario, some of the models have this very lagged warming, which then leads to strong warming. Um, uh, you know, past the, the point of emissions. Um, in the Ken ESM model, the, because it has such strong um, carbon sources, it, in order to, you know, the inferred emissions actually become negative and give it that kind of tail that curls back. But that's really like, you know, at the extreme member, at the extreme end of things where you start to really see things break down. Um, for, you know, for, for most of the regime, you actually see a very strong linearity uh, and proportionality of warming to cumulative emissions. On the, um, on the overshoot scenario on the right hand side, again, you still see a, you know, a roughly um, a rough proportionality of warming to cumulative emissions, even when you stop moving from left to right and switch direction and start moving from right to right to left uh, on this scenario. That you know, as you as you peak and then decline the emissions, the, the warming um, roughly follows that. And there's some exceptions to that, um, which I'll talk about. Um, uh, and but but you know to first order i think the, the key result is that you know proportionality roughly holds uh uh between warming uh, and cumulative emissions and those two exceptions are you know some models have this kind of positive asymmetry and some models have this kind of negative asymmetry in the initial sort of overshoot period um you know you can see some of them basically have a clockwise curvature and other ones have a counterclockwise curvature and then the second one is that one model the cesm2 wacom shows this really strong uh very delayed warming in the 23rd century um, even though the missions are basically flat in that time period and so i want to talk a bit about what we think is going on in each of those um the first one, uh, the the sort of clockwise versus counterclockwise um, curvature, um, I, you know. So this is really interesting. This is the thing that's been bugging me for for a while in in the background. I actually just made this figure on the right hand side this morning. So it's actually the the one thing here that's not in, the, in this manuscript, that, which is waiting revisions here. But um, the this we can actually explain this this counter this clockwise versus counterclockwise um, really easily, basically by this. Uh, this, this other metric that we use um, and, and, and did a whole MIP about this ZEC MIP, which is the zero emissions commitment. Basically, if you do a concentration force or excuse me, an emissions driven run, um, but with zero emissions after after warming, so that such that basically ocean uptakes CO2, land uptakes CO2, but also ocean uptakes heat. And so that the, the uptake of CO2 and heat kind of cancel each other out. Um, the, uh, the, the, you know, this, the, the, the committed warming after um, uh, after zero emissions is you know it's it's one of the uncertainties in the climate system and and in this paper uh, led by Andrew McDougall you know we sort of quantified this for a bunch of models that you know and and the the thing we used in the IPCC AR6 was it was that this zero emissions commitment was roughly zero but you know within but but possibly non-zero right and and so these models um, sort of show that the, the, some of the span of of of, of what plausible values of this um, hundred year zero emissions commitment could be. And so I just went through to the table in that manuscript and actually pulled out the, the 100 year zero emissions commitment from each of these models, basically how much warming you get um, compared to the point at which you, you assert zero emissions um, after 100 years, um, 
how much warming you get or or warming or cooling how much of a temperature change you get in in these models and if i if i compare that to the the temperature the, basically the temperature asymmetry which is if i subtract 200 petagrams of emissions from the point of peak emissions and i compare the temperatures on the on the ascending branch of that at at peak minus 200 emissions versus the, the temperature at the on the descending branch of that at you know peak minus 200 uh, petagrams of emissions and if i plot those two things against each each other they're basically you know super highly correlated um with you know with a slope that's not crazily different from one um again it's so you know i only have five data points um so i don't want to make a huge deal of this basically the, the ipsl model didn't 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 uh participate in, in the exact map so so we couldn't include that but for the five that did uh, participate in both you see that the, the, they're basically telling the same story which is that you know there's kind of asymmetry in the in the you know on the centennial time scale around peak emissions um, is is roughly this seems to be governed by the same sets of processes that are governing this committed warming um, under zero emissions. That basically it's the it's the you know the the relevant the the, the differing timescales of ocean carbon uptake versus ocean thermal uh, equilibration. Uh, but because both of those are are controlled by roughly the same process of ocean you know vertical ocean mixing, they you know they they tend to cancel each other out, but they don't perfectly cancel each other out. And because they don't perfectly cancel each other out, and you know in, in any given model, they they tend that seems to be consistent response both under this overshoot scenario as well as under the the, the zero emission screaming experiment so um yeah so i, I think I, I was i was glad when i made this figure this morning to 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 see that um that we i think we we can sort of there aren't you know there isn't a whole new extra degree of freedom in the earth system that we were unaware of uh it seems like that that this this asymmetry is respond is you know governed by the same set of processes that are governing the zec is it um Charlie, for that one, is that yeah. ZEC, is that defined relative, the temperature change relative to the time that you turn off the emissions or to the beginning of the simulation? To, yeah, to the relative to the time you turn off emissions. So it's okay. what's the committed warming uh, 100 years afterwards uh, versus uh, the, the, you know, as opposed to, to the, as compared to the temperature uh, you're at when you reach zero emissions. Because if you, uh, relative to the beginning of the simulation, you're still going to be in a positive territory for all these models, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, and yeah, but but you know, but but that but that point, you know, in the one of the other things that, that has been you know really widely used, I think, in the in the sort of communications around the AR6 was that because we were able to quantify this point, you know, the, we we've been able to say and sort of you know that that once you know make this point that once we reach net zero CO2 emissions, um, we don't expect there to be a large committed change in the temperature. Um, and I think that you know that's that's a, a thing that people have a sort of hard time grasping it right? because we, we we expect that the, there to be some committed warming to you know if you hold CO2 constant. But the point is under net zero emissions CO2 isn't constant. CO2 is going to decline under net emissions. And so the whether you get a warming or cooling depends on you know the, the whether you know how strong the the subsequent uh, emissions are as you know from the point yeah from the point of near zero emissions versus the um, versus the 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 time scale of of temperature equilibration uh, and that seems to be what's going on here as well um the other big thing the other sort of big you know lack of of, of proportionality of warming to emissions is is in this one model esm 2 wacom which shows this really strong you know sort of you know leg of warming um in the 23rd century um and you know, we think we know what's going on there. Which, if you look at the the spatial pattern of it, it's it's you know it's confined to the northern hemisphere, mid and high latitudes, with a peak over the North Atlantic, and that timing wise, you know, basically that's the only model that shows a really strong weakening of the of the AMOC, uh, and then subsequent recovery of the AMOC in that scenario. And so what seems to be going on is that the, the recovery of the AMOC as a result of uh, of the overshoot, um, which then leads to you know sort of a, a reversal of of a transient cooling that's, ba that's basically an AMOC weakening driven cooling uh, located over that region, which be then because it re reverses then then gets um, at at this. Um, you know, causes this this much much delayed warming in the model, um, which you know, if that's a real feature of the Earth system, that's definitely a thing to be aware of, and and I think you know a lot of the work that's been done now to compare um, the the transient dynamics of or transient versus equilibrium dynamics of CESM two and E three SM have shown that this difference in the sensitivity of the AMOX circulation um, is is you know basically both models have super high equilibrium sensitivities, but CESM two has a much lower transient sensitivity, um, and 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 so I think the, the, you know because of the, the 
the the the sensitivity of AMOC. And so this this result sort of is is I think consistent with that 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 basically the the, the AMOC weakening in, in CSM two leads to this kind of temporary uh, uh, temporary masking of some of the warming, which then comes in uh, much later. Um, and you can you can see that again here if you look at if you do this kind of zonal mean comparison, you know you see this the, all the patterns you'd expect, right? Strong polar amplification of warming, um, crazy high warming values under the high emissions, um, you know slightly less crazy high warming under the overshoot, and then you know in CSM two Wacom, you see you kind of see this this transient cooling during the 22nd century, which then reverses again into the 23rd. That, that we think that's due to this kind of AMOC weakening that leads to a, a, a transient sort of masking of some of the warming regionally. Um, uh, but which then reverses. Um, and so, yeah, so just to conclude, because I don't, I don't want to go too much over, that, you know, carbon cycle responses in both long-term scenarios include reversals of the global sink in either the land and or the ocean, um, but for very different reasons, right? The land might become a source under both net negative and long-term very high emissions, whereas the ocean would only become a transient source under strong net negative emissions. Um, Superwide model disagreements in the land sink are particularly strong under high emission scenario. The models disagree on the timing, the location, the strength, and the vegetation and soil partitioning. Um, somewhat better agreement in the overshoot scenario. Um, the, over, the ocean models agree, you know, much more qualitatively, but there's still actually a fairly wide ensemble spread um, in the ocean models uh, after 2100, particularly under the high emission scenario. Um, overall, this proportionality of warming to cumulative emissions still generally holds under both scenarios, um, with the two sort of exceptions. One, you can get this, this some degree of asymmetry um, under the overshoot, which seems to be uh, at least consistent with the, with the zero emissions commitment, and so probably governed by the same processes, you know, the relative uh, timing of CO2 uptake by the oceans and, and heat uptake by the oceans. And then the long-term div um, divergence from portion proportionality to warming um, uh, 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 can be seen in both scenarios, in particular under CESM2 that uh, is responsive, the, what we think is the AMOC recovery under the overshoot and or lag, you know, very lagged warming in KSM5 under the very high emissions. Um, and so with that, I will acknowledge Rubisco and the uh, DOE Early Career Program and stop.